Okay, hello, my name is Tamar Fredman, and on behalf of JFN, I am happy to welcome you to today's briefing on poverty and the impact of COVID-19. This webinar is part of a series hosted by the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty. The National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty is a collaborative of funders, Jewish federations, direct service providers, researchers, media outlets, and advocates dedicated to fighting poverty in the American Jewish community. This is a third of these briefings, and we will be having another one on Tuesday, June 23rd from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, during all these briefings, we will discuss the many challenges the coronavirus pandemic has created for Jews facing poverty and the agencies that serve them. We will hear the needs from the service providers on the ground supporting our front lines, share best practices and information, and strategize on ways to respond collectively. And today we have a very interesting conversation focused on systems. I will now hand it over to our moderator for these conversations, Susan Ditkoff of the Bridgespan Group in Boston, who will frame the conversation and introduce today's speakers. Thank you, Susan. Terrific. Hi, everyone. My name is Susan Wolf-Ditkoff. I'm a senior advisor at the Bridge Bend Group. Thank you so much, Tamar, for kicking us off. Um, welcome to the uh, webinar that is uh, we're, we're in a series. Um, we started off with a very high level framing um, at the end of March, and then since then have had more focused webinars on issues of food insecurity, housing insecurity, um, mental health, older adults, some other areas, and there'll be more focused areas to come. But today we wanted to sort of pause and uh, think a little bit, pull the camera back um, and think a little bit about the systems um, within which um, these organ the agencies are operating um, and think a lot about systems change. Um, as we are all watching the news and reading the paper, there is a tremendous amount of, of systems change going on. Um, a, and different views on what it is, what it means, and, and how to achieve it, um, specifically around race and racism, uh, but also around inequities um, of other kinds, um, economic inequities and others. Um, so there are kind of different effects going on. So today, I think we're going to focus a little bit on um, more the, the economic inequity side of things, um, although we may touch on race as well. Uh, but at any rate, I'm delighted here to have two incredible professionals, seasoned professionals with expertise across a number of sectors. Um, Ruben Rotman is the founding president and CEO of the Network of Jewish Human Services Agencies. Um, Ruben has a network of about 140 member organizations that are on the front lines um, and we look forward to hearing stories uh, from the front and, and what it's taking to, to make change happen. Um, we also have Charlene Seidel of the Leish, Leish, Leish Tag uh, Foundation. Um, thank you, Charlene, for joining us. Charlene has been um, the Executive Vice President of Leash Tag and has also served um, at the uh, Jewish Community Foundation of San Diego on the board of the San Diego Grantmakers, um, as well as on the board of the Jewish Funders Network. So many, many decades, um, even though you are all a, a youthful 29 years old, um, a very uh, experienced uh, panel today. So thank you both for, for thinking about this with us. Um, I thought I would start off with a couple of framing remarks about um, what systems change means and how to think about it. Um, there, are, you know, if, if you if you ask three people in the nonprofit sector or the government sector or the activists, you know, among activists, what does systems change mean? What does field building mean? Um, if you ask three people, you'll get four answers. Um, everyone has a slightly different sort of camera angle in on on what this means. Um, and there's a lot of, I would say, information overload right now. So what I thought I would do is just propose a couple of very simple um, characteristics of, of a field. What does it mean to try to do a field building strategy? And especially in a moment like this that is so dynamic um, and things are changing so quickly. Um, a, a number of years ago, um, the Bridge Bank Group, um, along with the Irvine Foundation, <clears throat> published a document called the Strong Field Framework, which is available on the Irvine Foundation website. Um, and more recently, um, my colleagues um, have published a document called Field Building for Population Level Change. Um, and, and in a nutshell, there's sort of a few different pieces of markers of progress, I would say. This is not sort of a recipe book, um, but it is just what are the kinds of things that you would want to, to put in place or be thinking about as you think about um, field level and systems level change. 
Um, the first is a shared definition of the problem. Um, that is so critical because everyone has a slightly different reason why they are coming to the table. Um, and one of the questions of, you know, how are we framing this moment? How are we framing this problem is important because otherwise what happens is um, the different agendas sort of take over and and without clarity on what is the work that that we're trying to to accomplish. Um, a second important piece is uh, the knowledge base and the data um, of what is it that we know and what is it that we believe um, about the causes of this problem and what it's going to take to uh, solve it um, at a, at a, in, a, in, a, in a significant way um, beyond just um, a few organizations at a time. Um, the third is a set of actors and a set of institutions um, that are collectively um, envision themselves as people who are working to develop the shared identity and the shared vision. Um, a fourth is a field level agenda, meaning um, an agenda could be everything from um, the message, it could be um, adaptive solutions that people are experimenting with and just a, sort of a, a, a way to take a, a, a way to view where we are and sort of think about taking it to the next the next level. Um, and then the last one that I would propose is um, very close ties to the communities that people um, are hoping to benefit. And in fact, making sure that the people who are intended to be benefited are centered in the strategies. Um, because I think there's a lot of sort of top down uh, uh, examples of um, of strategies that come from the top or from the outside um, that, that fail, that don't work, um, which is not particularly surprising when you pause and think about it, um, but, but really engaging um, beneficiaries as the co-owners, co-creators um, of their own solutions and, and, allocate, and people who can allocate resources to their own solutions. Um, so uh, bringing expertise to bear, but, but really sort of deep, authentic engagement. So let me pause there. Um, that was that was a fair amount, um, but just thinking about um, some of the different um, angles. What I'd love to do, Ruben, is just is start with you and just tell tell us a little bit about about this moment before we kind of get into some of the elements that you are seeing out there in terms of you know collaborative or field building approaches. We'll just st stop for a minute and try to frame the moment. Um, so sort of where are we? How have things changed in the last? three or four months and, um, you know, specifically just how have responses by um, human services agencies changed? How has the agenda had to adapt um, in the last sure. few months? Sure. So if, if I could take everybody back because I, Susan, I was part of the conversation in, in March when we, we started this whole adventure together. Um, we, we, are, we are still living in the craziness and the gray and the uncertainty of what this pandemic is all about. And so in early March, when our agencies um, needed to follow government mandates around shutdown, there was a literally almost overnight drive to close offices where necessary and to transition service delivery to virtual platforms. That was um, both confusing, intense, exhausting, um, but also pretty exhilarating because agencies learned pretty quickly that they were able to continue to provide service delivery in a manner and a fashion that they had never before previously operated in extensively. And so some agencies might have done some things virtually, but now they were forced to do almost everything virtually. Um, and so we're now three to four months past that. And to this day, despite the fact that many states have started to reopen, most of our agencies are still continuing to provide most of their services virtually. If they've gone back into the office, it's been for administrative purposes. Um, it's been for some back office work that needs to be done. But primarily the client service delivery is still taking place in virtual platforms. And um, the use of volunteers has still been structured to enforce the social distancing requirements to make sure that they're being taken care of for their own health and that the client that they're providing the volunteer service for is also being taken care of. Mm -hmm. um, the other dynamic though that's happened is that um, the populations have shifted. So at the beginning, the focus uh, was on ensuring service delivery 
for their existing client base, the people they were already working with. Um, and now that is continuing, but it's been expanded to new individuals, new clients who are seeking service delivery because of the impact of COVID-19 on their particular situation. Um, I would say that the biggest areas of need, I don't think are gonna be surprising to you. They've been in the area first and foremost of food assistance because very, very clear concrete need around not only affordability of food, but simple access to food. There were plenty of vulnerable clients and now even more so who simply did not have because of the restrictions related to COVID-19, the ability to go out and go grocery shopping. And if they were able to get out to the store, they weren't necessarily able to get the products that they were looking for or that they needed, um, either because of scarcity or, or, or other dynamics at play. And so food has been a big issue. Second to food has been emergency financial assistance for a range of issues. Could be utility assistance, could be rental assistance. Um, it could be assistance related to um, providing funds for um, some bills that they fell behind on because of changes in their employment status. Um, and so some agencies have seen a pretty significant increase in those requests. Other agencies have seen a pretty flat level, not a dramatic increase in those requests yet. Um, the last area though, um, which we're starting to now see some of, not universally across the country, but again, some of, has been in the domain of unemployment. Um, as you know, you've read in the papers and you've seen the dynamic going on. There have been um, pretty significant layoffs and furloughs, and those have been um, uneven. It's not like one industry was impacted. It's been pretty universal across many industries. And um, there's been confusion around the degree to which individuals aren't going to get maybe rehired back because of the, the government PPP loan um, and, and the ability of the agency to maintain positions. Um, and you know there was a lot of, of angst around that process. Um, but there's also um, concern around if they're not going to be rehired back, um, where are they going now? And so we have started to see, again, it's not universal, but we've started to see some people beginning to reach out. Now, as you know, when um, the CARES Act was passed in the U.S., there were provisions to extend unemployment and also to increase the amount of the unemployment benefit. And so for some individuals being laid off and collecting unemployment, if they were able to navigate the maze of the bureaucracy of the process, which ranged dramatically from state to state, but if they were successful and able to navigate that, for some individuals, depending on their position, they might be taking home more than they did previously when they were employed. Others, even if they're taking home less, there's so much uncertainty with the volatility of, of, of the field and, and looking for work um, that individuals aren't universally rushing for help in terms of rebounding. Um, but we're beginning to see the beginning trickles of it. And the way we know that is many of our agencies are starting to offer more virtual workshops around the career search process and around managing um, sort of the grief and anger and loss around being laid off. Uh, and we're starting to see more and more people reach out and participate in those offerings. And again, those are individuals who previously were never clients of our agencies before. So I said a lot, I was sort of all over the place, but I hope I answered your question. <laughs> No, absolutely. Let's just stay on this one for a moment, Charlene. If you, Charlene, if you want to um, sort of let us know from your perspective just how you're seeing this moment, and then we'll kind of go through some of the more detailed questions. But you've been working with grantees, with grantors, um, with communities for for such a long time. How are you seeing kind of this moment? How is it different from a few months ago? And what's your sense on where it's heading? 
Yeah, no, thank you, Ruben. There was, there was a lot there, but it was really helpful. I actually was thinking about some of our own needs. So in this community, which I'm sure tracks, you know, similarly to others yep. in that, you know, we had this incredibly, you know, this intensification of need on all levels that happened very, very quickly. Our first move sort of as philanthropy was to, well, we had a couple, but as a foundation was to number one, like first and foremost, like the first day, you know, we went on say a stay at home order. We contacted all of our grantees. We split it up among our staff. We reached out, we phoned every single one of our grantees, including in Jerusalem and Israel had already kind of was about a week or two ahead of us. And the value of existing relationships and ramping up support during these difficult times. I mean, it sounds a bit cliche, but I feel like just from a pragmatic standpoint, it has just come to bear so much in so many ways, and I'm happy to build on that. Um, and um, as much as possible, then, we have um, tried to, number one, give flexibility as much as possible. So we sort of immediately pivoted to accelerate funding if we had you know funding commitments for later in the year, getting, you know, there was worries about cash. Basically, our goal was let's not have these organizational leaders or you know beneficiaries but organizational leaders that are our intermediaries making crisis decisions let's not if they need to reorganize their staff you know in a month in two months or three months we didn't really know when this was going to be what the you know what the journey looked like but let's not do it the day after or a week after the stay at home order so actually um and i don't know if this is too detailed Susan in terms of what we did because um, one of the things that we did and and there's a few but was even before the PPP loans were announced we provided bridge funding in terms of interest-free loans to allow organizations to keep their staff that were our grantees that were sort of immediate um, so that they wouldn't have to um, make those crisis decisions knowing the decisions were along the pike um, in terms of what we're seeing in the moment you know I mean, I could go on with other things we did, but I could also do that later. Um, yeah. You know, we're, we're really like drilling down on where our leaders are in this moment in time, um, you know, isolation. Um, we've also found, I guess, in just in our micro experience that what you said, Ruben, about people not immediately, like there wasn't an immediately groundswell for requests for help. Like when we talked to some of our social service partners, I was surprised about that. Right. And now I think that is ramping up um, mm -hmm. in a way I, from my experience, different from the recession. Um, at the recession time, maybe because it was a slower, I, I don't, I mean, I could speculate, but there seemed to be when we were addressing the recession, there seemed to be, um, um, you know, more of an immediate need in terms of basic needs that presented itself. I, this just seems slower. That's just one, like one foundation's experience. And um, yeah, I have, I, I can share yeah. more about, I think like how philanthropy and our foundation has reacted in the moment, but I think I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, no, that's great. And Ruben, just sort of thinking about the changes that you just observed and Charlene, some of the responses, um, things that you did is very helpful because I think that right now people are trying to figure out, like it, it does feel like there's a little bit of a, of a transition going on mm -hmm. now. So mm -hmm. there was sort of the initial shock and you know fetal position that everyone was in. Right. And then where there was kind of this weird, sort of moment in time where everyone's in their house, right, sort of locked down. And now just as things are starting to open up again, but uh -huh. really differentially, um, it's just in this very different place. And Ruben, as you said, just the dynamics of saying, okay, well, if uh, the unemployment uh, benefit is going to go away, what does that mean? And right. the foreclosure, you know, right. moratorium is going to end. What does that mean? How do we, right. how do we think about that? Right. And, and related to that, um, while the PPP payback period was, or the coverage period now has been extended through the end of the year, um, that's actually not helping most of the agencies, at least in our network, because most of them, if they applied, received the funding either in the first or the second round. Uh -huh. And so they will have already been exhausted. You know, the funds will be over. Um, and there are going to be some pretty serious questions that are going to need to be answered around their capacity in terms of being able to retain and stay whole. Um, I, I am 
overall, the dynamic in our network has been that this year, this fiscal year, between emergency COVID funding that many received or emergency COVID fundraising that many agencies implemented on their own or with support from Federation, and between the PPP loans and between the ability to um, claim reimbursement for government funded services that at the beginning, they were unclear government was gonna reimburse for if it went virtual. They got the green light. Government overall, by and large, is covering most of their services that, that are now virtual. Um, and so the, the view right now is this year, they're going to be okay. Most of our agencies are going to be okay and are going to get through this fiscal year. Yeah. There's grave, serious, though, really deep concern about next fiscal year um, and the implications of everything from donor fatigue to the uncertainty of to what degree um, government will continue to honor the reimbursement as virtual service delivery I firmly believe is not going to go away now. Yeah. The agencies are not going to universally pivot back just like they pivoted to virtual. They're not going to flip the switch and go back to in-person universally across the board. It's going to be very, very, very slow and deliberate and thoughtful. Yeah. Um, and the degree to which insurance providers and government will honor that dynamic is still an open question. Yeah. Good. So that's a great segue to sort of the second, you said there was a lot in there. So it's a great segue to kind of the second thing I wanted to cover, which is this idea of what does it mean to really take kind of a holistic view in this moment? Um, again, field level change, systems level change, advocacy, there are different words for it, but, but what's absolutely clear is that there are, um, we're not gonna go back to the way things were. We don't know what we're going to go to yet. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when we get there, that's gonna change also, because as soon as this fall, there is a, you know, outbreak, you know, we might go back to three weeks of lockdown or mm -hmm. schools might close again or whatever that is. So even sort of, there isn't like some new normal that we're gonna get to, or that we're gonna to get to, or that we're gonna to get to, the, the new normal feels like it is continuing to adapt to new normals, um, which is a right. very, at a meta level, um, it's a very disorienting thing, especially for people who like strategic plans. Um, and so my question is really, as you think about that, oh, sorry, one other thing you said, which is that, you know, state budgets are, um, are really a concern for people, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you think about the next, the coming fiscal year, state municipal budgets are getting cut by 10, 25, 20, 25%, um, given the decrease in revenues and a whole bunch of other things, um, as well as all of the COVID related expenses that are still to come to, again, open up our schools yes. or open up and millions and millions, hundreds yes. of millions of dollars to open up our schools um, uh, nationally um, and all the equipment and PPE and testing. And so, yes. so if you kind of think about the fact that, you know, state budgets are not gonna be 100% focused on this problem. They've got a whole lot of other things going on and this sort of continuous sort of change and this continuous change of, of the new normal. Um, just talk a little bit about what does that holistic view mean to you um, in, in this moment? So, uh, you know, for me, what I would argue, and I, I don't think this will, uh, it may sound like a cliche, but I think it's an important concept to try to get your, your arms around. Traditionally, the human service sector and the Jewish human service sector is no different, is thought of as the sector to support those truly in need, those at risk, the, the, those with chronic financial hardship or, or serious challenges, either physical or psychiatric, that limit their capacity for independence or self-sufficiency. That will remain the case, but the pandemic has been the great equalizer. Everyone has been impacted by this. Everyone is living with the economic impact, the economic downturn, um, the quality of life impact, and the anxiety that comes with that. And um, all of the unrest and, and the issues related to disparities in this country, all of this feeds this this angst that we're all living through. And so for me, I think the systems look needs to become a conversation whereby the human service sector 
becomes not just about those truly at risk and vul most vulnerable, but it becomes about all of us and the extent to which our agencies are able to position themselves as resources for all and that government understands that our sector are partners in helping to provide responses and services for all um, and philanthropy understands that as well. I think that will serve us all very, very well um, yeah. because you know, unemployment is happening at all income levels. Mm -hmm. This is not just the lowest salary earners who are being laid off. No. Um, industries are closing. Mm -hmm. um, businesses are not going to make it through. And the ripple effect is significant. When a school closes, it has an impact not only on those who depend on school lunch because they won't have the ability to buy food, you know, to feed their kids, um, it has the impact on everybody that sends kids to that school. Um, the teachers, the staff, as well as all students at all income levels. So, um, you know, and, and I know that we have, um, within our own workforce, our agencies also employ people who really have been impacted by no child care. Balancing work at home while balancing children at home. This is a universal concern. So one of the dynamics that our agencies have been doing is they've been doing more and more programming, for lack of a better word, support groups that have really touched a chord because the content has been normalized. You know, everybody's dealing with parenting angst and parenting challenges. Everybody's dealing with adult parents you know, aging parents who are struggling with the isolation. You know, everybody's yeah. dealing with economic uncertainties. Mm -hmm. And so providing guidance, support, resources in a manner that addresses all of those needs makes the sector universal and I think um, provides an image for systems delivery, which I think opens up a new conversation. Yeah. No, it's such a powerful point because, you know, schools really, schools opening really are a fulcrum for a lot mm -hmm. of other things that are, that need to happen, um, especially when people need to go to work. They can't work from home. That's not what their, what their job is. And sort of what does it mean for children to be home on super, you know, alone unsupervised. Um, and there is tremendous pressure on the schools to open um, and open safely, but opening safely is incredibly expensive, which again, puts that bigger hole in the, in the state budget. Um, so it's, they're great points, um, especially about how the, you know, the workforce has to adapt, um, the agency workforce has to adapt in these and, moments. Yeah, and increasingly our agencies are hearing that schools, many of them, are going to go into these hybrid models. Right. Where they're right. going to be some in person and some remote. And right. so the child care dynamic is not going to go away. Yeah. So, um, Charlene, tell us a little bit about, from your perspective, how do you think about the holistic view sort of in this moment? I mean, you've worked with so many different kinds of collaborations, different kinds of funding networks, different um, on the ground, um, really close um, work with communities who um, you're hoping to serve. So say a little bit about how you think about this. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Um, so we actually, I think I might have mentioned to you that we actually have sort of in our, looking back at our decade plus of since we became independent, the strong field framework that you mentioned earlier has been kind of a core, you know, framework for us in terms of um, the ability to rally networks around um, a common goal that's fairly specific a shared identity standards of practice and just like a kind of a formula for um, for putting collective resources together and identifying strengths and weaknesses. Uh, we've also, and I think this is really, you know, important to note in the moment, we've also really um, put a um, stamp of iteration on that so that like for us, like we don't even have strategic plans and we really, we're very, very iterative. We really, I think one of the positive things about this moment in general is that the tolerance, and you sort of alluded to this, I think, Ruben, that the tolerance in general for risk is probably like 
I mean, you have the lowest barrier for risk than you're ever going to have. At least I feel like that from philanthropists, from foundations, you know, organizations and programs have, I, I mean, I hope this is, we feel, the most um, ability to take risk because everything has been so disrupted. And so the, the idea of even, you know, having kind of a formula for this moment, I think iteration has to be the formula. It's got to be... Mm -hmm building on the relationships that you have, taking the risks, you know, kind of educating if you don't feel like you have that kind of a support. But as philanthropists, which we really feel that philanthropy is the risk capital of social change, that, you know, philanthropy has to be out in front of a lot of these issues. And while I certainly agree with you, Ruben, and I think you're being like kind of specific to the human services issue, um, yeah, we're all kind of, I mean, I saw this in a meme, but like we're all in the same storm, but we're definitely in different boats in how we're in the inequities in the ways that we're experiencing sure. this. So mm -hmm. as much as we can like um, slice and dice that, I think risk and also be real specific about the communities that we're engaging, involving, um, really listening. Angelica Berry, who some of you may know, is on our board and um, we did an, I did an interview with her a few weeks ago and um, she said that Russell, she quoted Russell, her late husband, would say that the key to sales is listen, 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 you know, to the client. And so we really like have, as we've built on existing relationships, thinking that the key to this moment and in general holistic um, change and system change and community change is to listen, iterate, do keep mm. listening, iterate, do, and to continue on. And especially like in times of major disruption, like that's a formula that I at least believe will work, you know, better than ever. We actually like instituted our, our initial focus groups around one of our areas of change. I mean, it wasn't actually in the poverty area. It was in building Jewish life in the area that we live in. We did a bunch of focus groups because of all levels of the community of all kinds of beneficiaries. And because we're in a community where only about 8% of our Jewish population affiliate with any institution. But anyway, the focus groups themselves were such an interesting tool. And the discussions that we had that we now, it's just like part of our culture. It's now like a program. So it's a constant feedback loop. And the more in these moments of intense disruption and intense inequity in our Jewish community, external to our Jewish community, the more we can keep those feedback loops active, the, the better. Right. Um, yeah, the other thing, I, maybe I'll just, oh, go ahead. You no, know, I, I was just going to say, this is a, a, a culture change in human services because traditionally, a human service professional, a therapist, a social worker, a psychologist, would not necessarily, in developing a program, seek that input from the potential users of service. But we've been, here at our network, we've been promoting that and helping agencies to do that, even in the poverty space. Mm -hmm. So we administered last year what we called our Jewish Poverty Challenge. And part of that was to support agencies who wanted to innovate in their Jewish poverty response um, to achieve greater impact. And part of the dynamic that we, we encouraged and we helped them to figure out was how to engage the users of service for feedback on their proposed innovation. Because you don't want to um, sort of lead a client on that if you ask them for their input, are, are they going to get something in return? What does that mean? You know, there, there's layers here that get a little bit complicated, but still that input is very, very essential to, de to develop a service that's going to be meaningful and lasting. Um, yeah. And we've been doing that. So... No, absolutely. And I think, you know, there's been a long standing conversation in the field about dignity, right? About the mm -hmm. dignity of the people who are being served and who we're trying, you know, one is trying to help. But I think the, the conversation, at least as I've seen it, is sort of even, shifted. Sorry, sorry. But even yeah, yeah. like the language, I think, right. like is interesting, right? Like right. I've used that, like, who is right. philanthropy trying to help? Well, that is like, how is it more of a partnership? I mean, I think like this moment just offers a lot of these interesting questions and how we position systems change. Go ahead, sorry. No, no, that's exactly where I was going with it. Just no. to say, let me say this, I want to, I want, I would love some specific examples, Charlene, just on this one, because, you know, again, it was always about dignity of the, of the person served, but now even that feels, 
oddly paternalistic, right? To, to say that, you know, it's, there's still sort of that, that dynamic. Um, and so really thinking about not only for, for the practical reasons that to the extent that beneficiaries are not included in the design and, you know, research development service, you know, service design, um, it won't work as well, right? Um, they do need expertise, they need money, but they also need sort of some agent, you know, authority um, and agency about that. Um, which is, you know, to your point, Ruben, very different. Um, but also, it's just sort of morally, it's it's more of the right thing to do um, to not kind of have those sort of top-down sorts of programs. So, right. so that's exactly where I wanted to go, Charlene. If you just on the the language, even or just sort of the how we're thinking about this, and maybe just some examples. I know you've done so much work with communities um, in the past. Um, just some examples of what does this look like, and how does how do you think about systems change um, with this lens? I mean, in terms of the language, like it's definitely, you know, I mean, we're clearly in a different uh, situation than a, a human services organization where we don't have maybe some of the guidelines, you know, around even just confidentiality. And, um, but we, we've also found, and probably this is generally true, that number one, like those who, like a lot of those in, in need, quote unquote, Aren't like in the self aren't self identifying as in need. That there's got to be other ways in order to identify identify them and work with them, partner with them that are just not traditional. And so these sorts of like ongoing, like setting up this kind of this culture of listening, like really the kind of trust based relationships, working with grassroots leaders. Um, we've really um, in Jerusalem, our whole strategy has been around talent. So we literally, alongside grassroots leaders, we map the influencers by neighborhood. Like influencers, not like the head of, you know, a major institution, that's great too. But like on this street, in this neighborhood, and I know this is, you know, not realistic for everything, but just sort of the mindset on this street, in this neighborhood, who is like influencing their peers? Is it the PTA president? Is it and who's trusted? It's sort of also going back to like here, especially, you know, we're a border community. So we have really wonderful Latino community here. And there's a, a promotoria model, like for health education, um, where there are women, like for breast cancer, right? There are women who are trusted in the community um, who, who they, you know, are trained. And so it's a sort of a job training. They maybe don't have formal education, but to kind of talk about, say, breast health self-checks, right? And then they're the ones that are charged with micro-community influence and micro-community engagement, whether it's 20 women, 100 women, 1,000 women, they're going to be the ones that are trusted. And I think we can do, I mean, we've tried to, and we're continuing to try, I just don't want to imply that we're perfect, but even in our North County Jewish strategies, we've really tried to unpack and dissect in this community where so many are unaffiliated and so many aren't just like showing up at the doorways of whether it's human services, institutions, JCCs, whatever, like who, who are those kinds of influencers? Because a lot of, especially, you know, probably always, but a lot of the trust is in peer to peer engagement. Like if you trust somebody to recommend a doctor or whatever, you know, or a book, I mean, that's who you're going to. So, so I, those sorts of really like ground up strategies, I think are, have, have been working and, and, and are going to be really important. Um, and um, also like using an example from Jerusalem, sort of understanding um, like localized change. So like when we kind of are setting goals, really making the goal more about like the street or the block or the set of streets and not like these lofty really like, I mean, I don't want to put judgment on it, but really making goals and indicators of success very um, iterative as well, very specific, very, and kind of like understanding those small successes along the way so that always, I, another strategy that we've had that I think has been particularly um, conducive to the systems change approach in a kind of weird way is that we're a limited life foundation. So we're planning always for our exit from like the very first day. Like what is this program? What is this person? What is this relationship gonna do like when we're no longer in it? So it's, it's, it's that orientation also around building capacity and giving over that, you know, is probably more or less applicable in the human service world, I, I, which I really get. But I also feel like there are 
opportunities there um, to share ownership and power in ways that are going to be just much more tenable and sustainable and even probably cheaper in the long run mm -hmm. um, as we think about how to best provide those you know in need across the board with important services I'm not sure right. if that quite answered your question no no absolutely because i think that as we think about systems change sometimes people sort of assume that it's well if we're not talking about the individual organization obviously we're talking about policy change or advocacy and it's not that that's not part of it it absolutely is but a lot of what you're describing is kind of changing the ground sort of what's happening on the ground um in terms of service delivery um, as well. So let's let's sort of look at that at that intersection because Ruben, I know you've thought about this a lot of where are some of those examples of people who brought all these pieces together, all the pieces of you know the information, the understanding of the problem, bringing in the community, doing the policy and advocacy, that field level agenda. So so give us some examples of what you've observed working. And then sure. after this, I'm gonna open up the chat. If people um, want to add questions into the chat, um, we'll, we'll, we'll open up to, to others, but. Okay, so I, I can share a couple of examples that really stemmed from um, direct individual work with, with people in need. So as you know, shortly after the shutdown orders were put in place and the agencies needed to transition to virtual platforms, um, there was guidance from Medicare and Medicaid um, in the US that they would reimburse for audio and for platforms that were HIPAA compliant, meaning ensuring the confidentiality of, of the client um, and allow for both audio and visual. Um, video. So they were like computers or tablets or smartphones and you could use a platform that operated in that way and if you were able to do it, you could document the session and submit the session for a claim to be reimbursed. Um, that was absolutely helpful for clients that had access to internet, a computer, a tablet or a smartphone uh, or knew how to use them. Um, it was not helpful for a large number of clients that simply either didn't have those resources or didn't know how to use them if they had to or were uncomfortable or etc. And so there were cases after cases after cases, primarily older adults, but also adults themselves, that the agency continued to provide service delivery and was frankly eating the costs hoping that at some point there would be funding to cover those service hours. And enough cases were documented and enough of a message was crafted together, not only in our network, but in other behavioral health networks, that advocacy efforts went underway. We joined with other coalition groups and ultimately the, the decision did come through that Medicare and Medicaid um, in most states would cover telephone uh, service delivery. Um, another example had to do with SNAP. So SNAP is um, basically um, the term now for food stamps, but it's the funding entitlements that provide supplemental dollars uh, for an individual to be able to purchase food products. And as you know, with the dynamic of COVID and, and shopping and whatnot, um, there were segments of the SNAP beneficiaries who had difficulty getting to stores and the challenge with SNAP was you could not use the entitlement for online or over the phone purchasing. You needed to be in person present to give the card to the cashier. And so again, these stories were bubbling up from frontline caseworkers who were saying, it's all great that my client has SNAP, but they can't use it. And so we need to provide emergency cash assistance or we need to help them to, I need to place an order for them online because they don't have enough food. Um, and so those examples again bubbled up. We again joined with other coalition groups and we don't have 50 state coverage yet, but we're in the 40s now with the number of states that will allow the SNAP benefit to be covered for delivery. I would argue that those are both two examples of systems change that stem from real cases of real people falling through loop loopholes simply because government pivoted as best it could and didn't even fully realize there would be loopholes 
um, really, um, because of the dynamic of COVID-19 and needing to provide services and access for, for vulnerable populations. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as you as we think about those stories, just the, the interconnectedness of all the pieces is so important that it's not there's just it's not like a one off policy agenda or advocacy agenda. It really is um, unique and tailored um, in the way, Charlene, that you were talking about earlier of all the different pieces of fill building um, and sort of customized to that. Um, and oh, sorry, go ahead. I know I would just I, another example, which again is related. Um, is, uh, as you know, with the shutdown orders, particularly for older adults, there are no more senior centers really functioning as traditional senior centers. And so agencies that had funding for congregate nutrition or congregate senior center programming needed to request some flexibility from government to be able to pivot those dollars in, uh, and repurpose them. And by and large, most area agencies on aging, most counties did allow flexibility to allow agencies to shift congregate site dollars to home delivered dollars. And if you go across our country and you do the analysis, you will see very significant increases in home delivered meals. Not, and it wouldn't necessarily have been the same client that would have received home delivered meals pre pandemic but issues of access really have normalized the capacity of older adults across, equalized across, you know, across all levels um, and more and more are, re are needing that service. Um, and so the real question will be, where does this all go? Because we don't anticipate senior centers or congregate sites opening up anytime soon. And, and now the advocacy needs to be a play to keep that flexibility um, and to ask philanthropy to fill in gaps if there are gaps there. Um, and that's, so let's go there because I'm not seeing a, a lot of questions in the chat. Why don't we go there? Because I think the role of philanthropy um, is so important, not only in this moment, but especially when you talk about levering large government systems um, and trying to get them to, to do something different um, in this time. So for example, I, mean, I just want to cite um, just this morning, um, the Center for Effective Philanthropy came out with a new study called Funder Support During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Um, and it's at um, the Center for Effective Philanthropy is a terrific organization if you don't know them and their white paper is available on their website. But one of the things that they do, among other things, uh, is they surveyed about 170 grantees about what does this moment look like and, and and a lot of questions about funders in this moment um, and so a, a couple of things I just want to point to it's a little bit buried on page 13 or something but there's sort of this whole list of things that um, actions that funders um, can take or have taken during this time frame um, and I'll just read out a couple of them because I think they're interesting you know allowed goals of the current grants to shift um, extended the deadline for completing the work funded by current grants, waived reporting deadlines, um, or made them more flexible, proactively converted um, restricted grants um, to unrestricted grants, uh, restricted grants to unrestricted grants, provided supplemental grants, um, offered to discuss converting um, some of these you know, payment schedules um, and or accelerating payment schedules on, on grants. Um, and of course, obviously, more more money, <laughs> uh, more more funds, um, and so or reducing paperwork is sort of I think one of the other ones. So there are a, sort of a series of things, and if you kind of go through this, um, go through this list, um, there there are a number of different actions that that nonprofits were sort of suggesting that funders could take. But even to sort of and that really echoes I think where you were going, um, Charlene. But as you think about what funders can do, there's sort of the some of the mechanics of it, like how can they be most flexible and helpful um, in this time? But there's also the question of what role can philanthropy play in trying to move some of these systems with flexible dollars, but with obviously far fewer dollars um, that than, than government has to bring to bear. So, um, so I don't know, Charlene, if you wanna go back to your thoughts about what philanthropy can do or what, what this moment looks like relative to, you know, obviously the, Lots and lots of government money for the for the services themselves, but but there's still being important gaps. Sure, and actually, I hadn't you know I haven't read the CEP research yet. I'm I'm eager to, but I think you know it was kind of 
affirming because I think, you know, it was things that we've done and other foundations have done like right away in terms of expediting, you know, payments that were maybe scheduled later in the year, um, reducing or eliminating kinds of metrics that might have been, you know, rig too rigorous for the moment, really allowing the flexibility and the iteration um, and um, really like building on the trusting relationships that we already sort of have in place, which is of course the underpinning of all this. Um, in terms of the government, you know, in terms of government dollars, yeah, like leading those government dollars, like those immediate sorts of ideas that, you know, put like, you know, before like a government program is even announced, you know, staying in touch with the leaders of the organizations that we're working with and the people on the, to really anticipate those needs to maybe pilot some things that that could then be like a demonstrated proven result for a larger government. Um, and again, being really, really flexible around risk. Um, I think also that, um, well, a couple things. So this isn't directly related to advocacy, but one item that you didn't mention is um, technical assistance, which I think like, is really um, an important piece of like what we've been doing. And even like, as you saw the Jewish community organize around PPP, I mean, the, the, the service that JFNA provided in terms of immediately providing, from my view, magnificent technical assistance and capacity building to ready organizations was really incredible, I thought. And also like we've been doing just locally, like we've been sort of getting involved in technical assistance, even like learning where organizations might go to order, you know, um, uh, PPE, <laughs> like hand sanitizer and all that and facilitating like group orders. And that's really something that philanthropy can do with organizations so stretched and philanthropy having a little bit more of a bird's eye view and maybe having the relationships with even some of the companies that are providing is really like building on all the relationships. So in, in, in terms of the overall systems change, that's definitely a key piece of where we've been where we are, we definitely consider, you know, check writing one dimension of what we're doing. And then we think really hard during COVID, but also part of our DNA, I think, is, and for philanthropy to think really hard is, what are all the other resources at our disposal? Like, how do we use our voice? Like, what are the things we're seeing at cocktail parties? And, you know, what are, how are we best training, you know, or kind of developing leaders in the fields that we're supporting? How are we inspiring other funders? in order to join like many um, investments. I mean, that's a whole other subject, but like impact investing. And um, so, um, so there's just a lot of ways that funders have at their disposal to support important, you know, advocate important ideas. It doesn't have to look also like traditional advocacy. I find also, you mentioned advocacy sometimes to some funders, it's like, oh no, we can't get involved with that it's not legal. Well, there's actually like a lot we can do in terms of informal advocacy that is could be really, really valuable. And there is um, clearly a role, um, whether it's, and every foundation needs to find its own comfort level, but whether it's commissioning research, whether it's um, supporting the, some of these pilots that then, you know, if you don't want to be involved in like the direct sort of government advocacy, there's lots of lots of ways, local, building on relationships. Many of us in foundations, we have relationships with local electeds, we have relationships with state elected. How are we really building on those relationships to advance the causes that we care about? Um, one more thing that I'll just say, it doesn't really have to do with advocacy, but I think it relates to systems change, which is that I think now and always, I just read another article about this yesterday, there's a lot of talk about like nonprofit mergers that are gonna come out of this pandemic and you know, which is good. I don't want to denigrate it. At the same time, you know, I sometimes feel that it's going to have to be like, let's focus on our own sector first, maybe, and be a model rather than, I mean, nonprofit mergers are really hard. And there's a lot of reasons that they're hard and there are reasons that they work and they don't work. They really have to come from the ground up. I've never seen, well, I personally like, it's rare that like a funder imposed nonprofit merger is going to have the lasting sting. So what are ways that we as funders can work together? In San Diego, we joined together right away with the Jewish Community Foundation and the Jewish Federation to establish the San Diego Jewish COVID Emergency Fund. I know many other communities did that. I'm not, I mean, we were proud of this model in particular because we had private foundation and public philanthropy involved to just streamline those processes, like to organizations not having to apply to multiple sources to provide 
grant writing capacity support, like we're paying for grant writers for these organizations. And so there's a lot we can do in terms of funders um, to work together to model also strong collaboration that will perhaps um, inspire and also advance fields that we support. Well, we're going to have a, um, those are such great ideas, and we're going to have a discussion um, later on this um, summer about um, strategic alliances, um, m and So we will invite you back for that one. Oh, because, sure. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know. The, but, the yeah. headline is, it's so much harder than people think. Um, yeah. And, you know, just letting it all sort itself out is is um, is sort of Darwinian um, and and not not the right answer either. So how to how to pursue that? So excellent. Um, so Ruben, we've got about five minutes left. Tell us um, as you think about um, the role that philanthropy can play. Um, certainly, there's advocacy work, and Charlie, and it's funny that you mentioned that because we had um, I wrote an article a couple of years ago for um, SSIR on um, philanthropy and advocacy, and and the very first lesson is how much more you can do within your five hundred. 1c3 status as a funder than you think you can um, and so somehow some of that's coming coming back to the fore but um, so uh, so I 100% agree with that um, Ruben tell us a little bit about when you think about the role of philanthropy and what it can do at this moment I think it's a really nice way to kind of bookend uh, the session um, th this morning so I, I would only add to Charlene's comments by sort of um, encouraging nonprofits and foundations to really truly think of themselves as partners and as thought partners. Um, I think foundations should create a safe space for nonprofits to share challenges and simply talk them through, not with the expectation that they'll be funding necessarily, but rather how could we advance a solution for this challenge that you're struggling with? Some of it might be dollars from our foundation. Some of it might be dollars from government. Some of it might be new partnerships that could be brought about by other grantees that we're involved with as the funder. I, I, I would hope that um, this moment is one, because of the flexibility the funders have shown, both private foundations, and federations and government. This should be a moment that nonprofits could be open to sharing their challenges in very safe spaces and, and look for that thought leadership and that thought partnership. And I think all too often that doesn't happen really. Um, and it would be good to try to foster that new, you know, that new comfort. Um, all right. And that's really what this affinity group on Jewish poverty is doing. We're bringing together multiple funders, multiple service providers, you know, the media, academia, federations, and no one has the solution on addressing Jewish poverty. We're simply coming together to say, th these are the challenges that we're seeing. This is what we've done. This is what we haven't done. This is where we've, we've had success. This is where we've had roadblocks. We're, we're beginning that dialogue in safe space. And so we should only be continuing. This, this could be a model for how to do this conversation moving forward. No, absolutely. And just to sort of wrap up with some of the themes that you all have been talking about, I just, I really appreciate how, how much of this is building on things that um, in some cases are just good grant making, um, like don't laminate your theory of change because it's going to change. Um, hopefully, mm -hmm. if you're doing it right, um, it will change. Um, so, so the flexibility, some of the looking at um, different ways to create coalitions, different ways to um, take care of human capital and the people who are working in the agencies, um, making sure to center uh, the beneficiaries um, in, in the work um, authentically um, and not sort of as an afterthought or as a focus group, um, thinking about just what is the, the common messaging um, and just how do these pieces sort of fit together um, and policy pieces fit in fit into it um, to, to sort of take that, that broader view or that, that higher level view. So these are, you know, fantastic observations. Thank you so much for sharing them today. And um, we look forward to continuing the conversation in our, in our next webinar. Thank you so much, and thank you, Ruben, thank you, Charlene, and thank you, Susan, um, for moderating today's conversation. There's so much information to digest and to think about, but lots of other real tactical things that we can, we can learn from. Um, so like Susan mentioned, we are going to have another webinar on Tuesday, June 23rd from 
12 to 1 Eastern time. Look out for emails about the topics and the newsletter for the Poverty Affinity Group newsletter will come out next week, which will also talk about all the different upcoming webinars and learnings that we're going to do together. And you can also find information about JFN's programs and recordings of past programs at jfncovid19response.org. We have lots of information going on there that we would love for you to share. And if you have things that you would like us to post and to share with the community, you can always send that along to me and we can share it more broadly. So with that, I wanna thank everybody for participating and hope to see you again soon um, to learn together again. Thank you all. <laughs>